Thanks so much to the organizers for inviting me to this incredible symposium. Um, I'm really enjoying learning from all of the speakers and look forward to connecting at later points in the day. Uh, so I baked this cake with a bunch of folks from a lot of different disciplines, So, and I want to be sure to mention them. So Sam Wang is now at the Booth School of Business at the University of Chicago. Elena Arosheva is in the Departments of Statistics and Social Work, as well as the Center for Social Sciences and Statistics at the University of Washington. Jevin West and Carl Bergstrom, you'll hear from later on in the symposium. Carl, Jevin is at the Information School at University of Washington, and Carl is in the Biology Department at the same institution. All right. So the remit for this panel was to talk about where ideas come from. And one approach to thinking about this question is just to recognize simplistically that ideas come from people. Different people have different forms of expertise. And so you can create new ideas by combining folks with different forms of expertise into collaborative teams. And indeed, previous work finds that collaborative teams are more likely than solo authors to create novel combinations of ideas and that combinations that are atypical and span a longer interdisciplinary distance have higher impact. So one way of thinking about this question of where ideas come from is to recognize that we have this other question that we have to answer um, that sort of uh, uh, comes first, which is how is it that teams come to self-assemble? All right, now research on collaboration uh, has found that uh, there are lots of different reasons why people collaborate. So obviously there are intellectual factors, right? You want folks with the right forms of expertise. Um, there are instrumental factors. You need people who have the right collection of resources, whether that be funding or instrumentation. And then there are the more ephemeral qualities. There are these social factors, things like respect, friendship, curiosity seeking and fun <laughs> on the best of days, right? <laughs> um, in any case, um, but because there is this degree of social discretion in choosing which collaborators you work with, you might wonder, does decreasing social distance, does making so having that kind of social lubrication, does that increase collaboration between individuals? Now, for those of y'all who are coming from sociology, oh, sorry, I just revealed that I grew up in Texas. Sorry about that. <laughs> for those of y'all coming from sociology, uh, this question you might recognize is motivated by the principle of homophily that tells us that social similarity breeds connection between individuals. And in fact, a previous work in sociology finds that gender homophily in particular creates profound divides in work environments, voluntary associations, and friendships. Okay, so our research question is, is this. So is there gender-based homophily in collaborations across the heterogeneous scholarly landscape at varying levels of granularity? All right, the reason why this question is important is because previous work has found that women are already less likely to co-author as men, and when they do co-author, they're less likely to uh, take first or last author. Um, and given, of course, the professional advantages of collaboration, it's important to understand how and under what conditions women do collaborate. All right, to answer this question, we use um, as our data uh, the JSTOR corpus, which is a repository of papers across the humanities, social sciences, and natural sciences. Uh, we considered papers uh, that cited from 1960 onward. And uh, this uh, includes more than 250,000 multi-author papers uh, with more than 800,000 authorships. Authorships here are just instances of authors. Unfortunately, the data uh, that we're using does not disambiguate authors. Now, once we've got this uh, data set, what we need to do is impose a hierarchical clustering to those papers. To do this, we apply the hierarchical implementation of the InfoMap network algorithm to the citation network on the JSTOR corpus. And this reveals the hierarchical structure of the corpus through the efficient coding of random walks along the citation network. Okay. So um, at the lowest level of clustering, each paper is grouped into one of 1,450 terminal fields, which form the finest partition of the data. These are our closest intellectual fields. So hopefully we're in similar terminal fields here. Um, each higher clustering forms progressively coarser partitions of the documents by aggregating terminal fields into the 280 composite fields. And then as we go up the hierarchy here, at the very top level, we have 24 major fields. So higher, the hierarchical structure can have up to six levels. And at any level, papers in a common field are more connected through citations than to papers from neighboring fields 
and papers in fields at finer levels of the hierarchy are more connected than papers at fields at coarser levels. Okay, now to determine gender, um, we infer gender from first names when we have 95% certainty or higher. Uh, for 75.3% of cases, gender is determined through social security records. In 12.6% of cases, it's determined uh, through Genderizer, which uh, is a database that provides gender information uh, from user profiles at via citation networks. And in 12.1% of cases, gender is unknown and omitted from our analysis. In 7.6% of cases, it's because the name doesn't appear in either database. In 4.5% of cases, we just don't have enough certainty to impute gender. Um, and the rate of missingness here compares favorably to previous studies. Okay, now once you've got um, the hierarchical clustering and you've got a technique for determining gender, you can begin to see um, how heterogeneous the scholarly landscape is. And to just give you a flavor of this, let's take a look at the field level. So the largest field we have in our data set is ecology and evolution. You can see that um, per paper, uh, there's quite a number of authors, right? More than four um, in current times. The percentage of multi-author papers is impressive. It's almost, uh, it's uh, above 80%, right? And, but there aren't very many female authors, authorships, I should say. Sociology, um, in contrast, has fewer uh, average uh, authors per paper, um, still has quite a few uh, multi-author papers, but not quite as many, um, and they have uh, many more female authorships. Okay, take my discipline philosophy, um, <laughs> which looks quite bizarre. So uh, you can see that we have a lot of solo author papers, um, and uh, the rate with which women uh, author papers is abysmally low. Okay, so the JSTOR corpus is quite heterogeneous, and this creates some methodological challenges, um, and I'll talk through some of the techniques that we develop for managing those. Okay, so let's get back to the research question. So do males co-author with males and females with females more often than what we would otherwise expect? Okay, so we have to be mindful about a few things when answering this question. The first, obviously, is how do we have to figure out how to measure how often males co-author with males and females with females. But the trickier thing to figure out is Given the heterogeneity of this corpus, um, how do we figure out the counterfactual claim? How do we figure out whether or not that's more often than we would otherwise expect, okay? If it turns out that uh, the measure that we measure, um, that, that we observe in the corpus is higher than what we would otherwise expect, that's when we say that we have discovered behavioral gender homophily. Okay, so let's take the first question first. So how do we measure the tendency for same gender authorships to co-author? So we measure homophily by computing the difference in risks. So here, the measure of homoph homophily alpha equals the probability with which a random co-author of, of a random male is male, minus the probability with which a random co-author of a random female is male. And this measure is equivalent to the Pearson correlation of gender indicators for random co-authorship pairs, Wright's F coefficient of inbreeding when all papers have two co-authors, and Newman's network-based assortativity coefficient in an appropriately weighted network. So it seems like a very um, convenient and uh, powerful measure to use. All right, so how does this look? So let's imagine, let's take a toy example. Let's have a field. This field has a number of papers um, and each paper has a number of authorships where the green pieces refer to male uh, authorships and the red refers to female authorships, okay? And in this case, uh, when we calculate the uh, difference in risks, we find that um, the observed value of alpha is 0.45. Okay. Now let's move on to uh, the second bit, figuring out the counterfactual. So is this more often than what we would otherwise expect? Now one of the things that we talk about in this project is the fact that in order to measure this, you have to account for a couple of things. The first thing you have to account for is structural homophily. And the second thing is com compositional homophily. And I'll walk through each um, as we go here. So remember that this is the amount of homophily that we measured for this toy example. And to figure out whether or not this is more than what, how, what we would otherwise expect, what you could do is to fix the gender ratio of authorships, fix the number of authorships, and fix the number of authorships per paper, and then just randomly swap folks, um, and uh, then measure a counterfactual alpha value. Do this a few times, and then what you would find is a null, distribu null distribution of counterfactual alpha values. 
And the average value that we discover here is what we call structural homophily. So the deviation of alpha from zero due to structural aspects, in this case, gender ratio, number of authorships, number of authorships per paper, okay? So this is what we would find had everyone swapped randomly. <laughs> But this is just structural homophily. We also have to account for compositional homophily. Um, oh, sorry, one more thing. Um, and when we compare the observed amount of homophily in this toy example to the, counter, the, the distribution of counterfactual values, we see that the observed value is indeed quite rare. All right. And the p-value here is defined in terms of the proportion of values generated from the null distribution, which are greater than or equal to the observed value of alpha. And the small value here, at p-value here, implies that the observed alpha is unlikely to occur. OK, so now let's move on to compositional homophily. Um, one of the things we have to recognize is that um, people aren't um, equally likely to collaborate across the entire, entire scholarly landscape. Right? Folks are more likely to collaborate with people who are intellectually closer to them. All right? And um, in order to account for this, uh, we have to be mindful that each intellectual, narrow intellectual community will look quite different. All right? So let's imagine again that we've got a field, this is our toy example, with these same papers. But this time, let's imagine that we can divide this field into two terminal fields, right? um, where each terminal field is its own uh, intellectual community. All right? And um, to figure out whether or not the amount of gender homophily we observe is larger than what you would otherwise expect, what we can do is for each terminal field now, um, oh, sorry, notice that for each terminal field, um, they're, they're, they're different from each other, right? So they have different gender ratios, they have different number of authorships, they have different number of authorships per paper, okay? So when we're trying to figure out um, whether or not the amount of gender homophily we see is more than we would otherwise expect, um, then what, what we can do is fix the gender ratios, numbers of authorships, and number of authorships per paper within each terminal field, and then swap folks just within those terminal fields. Okay. And you might not think this is a big deal, but what we see is that the distribution of counterfactual alpha values shifts to the right, okay? Um, that it's harder now to demonstrate behavioral homophily because the value has shifted. Um, and here, uh, this average value of uh, these counterfactual values is what we call compositional homophily, which is just the deviation of alpha from the expected alpha under structural homophily that arises due to the tendency for authorships to co-author with those who are intellectually closer. Now, when we compare this value, uh, this distribution to the observed value, you see, you'll see now that uh, the observed value is quite expected given this uh, distribution. Um, and so we would no longer be able to say, uh, once accounted for, for compositional homophily, that we have behavioral homophily, okay? And this reversal due to gender imbalances and other structural differences across subpopulations is an example of Simpson's paradox in statistics and the Walland effect in population genetics. Okay. So in order to figure out this counterfactual claim of like how often, what would the rate of alpha be um, had you controlled for all these other things, um, this, is, um, this is basically um, the composition homo homophily. Okay. So now that I've given you um, the basic concepts and, and framework, what I want to talk about now is in more detail what the, what the process looked like. So what did we do? All right, so I've got the JSTOR corpus. We put it into this hierarchical clustering. And then what we do is we generate counterfactuals. So we assume that authorships in the same terminal field, the same smallest intellectual communities, are exchangeable with each other. And we assume that authorships in different terminal fields are less likely to swap and then we use citation flows between terminal fields to determine swap probabilities. We then use a Markov chain Monte Carlo Metropolis Hastings sampler to generate counterfactuals, take 75,000 draws to form the null distribution after a period of burn-in, which I think was about 10,000 draws. Then we compare these counterfactual alpha values to the observed value. Um, and we hypothesis test for all levels. So terminal fields, the smallest intellectual communities, the composite fields, and then the major fields. And then we use p-values adjusted by the Benjamini Yucatelli uh, procedure to control the false discovery rate at 0.05. Okay. Now what we find is that um, there is indeed behavioral homophily. Um, in 84% of top fields, 
What you'll find in the yellow column here is the measure, um, average measure of, uh, um, of uh, homophily you would find um, had everyone sort of sorted, uh, uh, randomly sorted themselves um, um, within terminal fields. Um, and then what you find in the blue uh, column is the actual observed value. In all cases, the actual observed value is larger. It's just that it's not statistically significant in all cases. We find uh, behavioral homophily in 29% of composite fields and then 8% in terminal fields. All right. And you might have noticed that um, we find a higher percentage uh, at the more aggregate level, right? And then uh, the percentages decrease as we get to the finer levels. And we think that part of what's going on here is that there's simply a trade-off between increasing testing power by aggregating data versus controlling for confounders by analyzing at a fine grain level. Okay, so um, if you want to get a sense of what this looks like in, um, for any particular field, we've got this visualization here. Um, thanks very much, Jevin, for putting this together. Uh, so what you can do here is you just click on let's uh, partition of the scholarly universe you're interested in. Um, and, um, as, and once you do that, what you can see is um, this distribution of counterfactual alphas, and the red line shows you the observed alpha for that particular partition of the scholarly universe. Um, and you can descend all the way down um, the hierarchy, where the top of the hierarchy is on the left side, and um, movement towards the end of the hierarchy is, to the, is towards the left. The different colors um, indicate the degree of statistical significance. So the darker green is, um, indicates the most statistically significant, and um, the, the lighter green indicates less. So I encourage you to, to play with that um, later on. All right. All right, so one question you might have is, um, how sensitive are these results to the missing gender indicators, right? Because um, remember, again, we uh, were missing more than 12% of uh, the authorship's genders. To evaluate this question, we did a sensitivity analysis, so we imputed gender for authorships under two scenarios. So in the low homophily case, we imputed each missing gender indicator at random according to the proportions of assigned genders in the author's original terminal field. And in this case, this imputation system uh, assumes no behavioral homophily in the imputed data. In contrast, we had a high homophily condition, so we imputed each missing gender indicator at random according to the proportions of assigned gender in the original paper. If the paper contains only unassi unassigned authorships, we impute a single gender for all according to the proportions of assigned gender authorships for the terminal field. And this assumes behavioral homophily because by construction, papers with one or no assigned authorships are always gender homophilous. And what we find is that um, uh, our, our results are fairly robust. So uh, these were the original percentages of behavioral homophily um, for top fields, composite fields, and terminal fields. In the low imputation uh, case, we find that the percentages are not very much different, right? Um, and then, of course, in the high imputation case, we find more. Okay, so these are fairly uh, resilient results uh, to uh, the missing gender indicators. Now. Given the fact that we do find gender homophily, behavioral gender homophily, you might be wondering, well, what are the, some of the char characteristics that are associated with um, behavioral gender homophily? And to um, evaluate this question, we fit logistic regression, uh, log logistic regression for all terminal fields where the outcomes, whether there is statistically significant behavioral homophily or not. And what we found was that behavioral homophily has a statistically significant positive association with the proportion of females in the terminal field and the terminal field size, okay? Um, now, this uh, result is consistent with previous work in economics that found that behavioral homophily was more prevalent in subfields with a higher proportion of females. On the face of it, this might sound surprising because you'd think that the more uh, women there are, the better integrated a sub area might be, uh, the more that we would see integrated teams. But this is actually not surprising from the principle of homophily, because as the representation of women increases, it's more likely that same gender individuals who are compatible along other key dimensions will become available as co-authors. 
All right. Now, one caveat about the secondary analysis is that you know, larger field size and balanced gender representation also increases the power of our testing procedure. I mean, it, it increases our ability to detect behavioral gender homophily. So one thing that we need to do in future work is to figure out how to tease this apart. OK. So to conclude, so we detect behavioral gender homophily in 84% of top fields, 29% of composite fields, and 8% of terminal fields. And since behavioral gender homophily is endemic to even the smallest intellectual communities, it might only be mitigated by changing, changing the cultural norms and perceptions that drive gender uh, homophily within intellectual communities. Okay. In future work, there are a few things that we hope to be able to uh, explore. So to my mind, the most important question is to evaluate um, the strategic value of uh, gender homophilous uh, collaborative teams. So in the short term, you might wonder, does gender homophily increase retention, productivity, and impact of the work that women do? Right? And the reason why you might wonder whether this is the case is because of psychological research on stereotype threat that demonstrates that the presence of other women in male stereotype domains enhances women's confidence, performance, and motivation. Okay? Now, you might think that, it, so if it turns out that it's a short-term uh, good solution for female collaborators, you might wonder about the long-term consequences of this. What happens if women iterate and do this over and over again? Does it lead to gender homophilous intellectual communities? And if so, does increasing the ratio of women in intellectual communities decrease the value or impact of that intellectual community, just as increasing the ratio of women in an occupation has, uh, decreases its prestige? Okay. And then there are also some methodological things uh, for us to work on. So the first has to do with incorporating temporal aspects. So right now, we implicitly incorporate some temporal uh, aspects by choosing to work with papers from just 1960 onwards. Uh, but we could do this more directly by um, uh, incorporating temporal information into the null distribution. Um, and then uh, and another thing we need to uh, work on is to figure out how to disambiguate authors. Um, and this is important uh, because in terminal fields with few female authors, we might actually overestimate structural and compositional homophily and underestimate behavioral homophily by allowing multiple female authorships corresponding to the same author to be re reassigned to the same paper. Okay, so thank you very much. Thanks also to Jennifer Jacquet, Molly King, Shelley Carell, and Ted Bergstrom for our early conversations. Thanks to our funders. And then finally, if you want um, some links to our paper or visualization or code, they're here. Uh, data, unfortunately, is under license from JSTOR, and you'll have to contact them directly for that. Thank you. <coughs> Hi. Very nice talk. Thank, oh, thank you. you. Uh, so uh, I, I was wondering, so you are checking for homophily, yes. looking at all the authors in a paper. And typically, what happens is that the people who choose who the, with whom they are going to co-author are the PIs, those yes. who appear at the very end of the papers. Right. And and I was wondering, well, if you look at the rest of the authors, they are not deciding anything most mm -hmm. of the time. <laughs> they are just like they're uh -huh. working because the others tell them to. Right. So I was wondering, did you look at all at what kind of effect this would have in your results? We did not in this project, but that's a great question. And previous work did try to figure out whether or not having a woman as a PI increased the rate with which you had women um, collaborate at, on the collaborative team under the assumption that women were more likely to proactively mentor women. Um, and I think that, the, and they found some mixed results in that case. Um, but it was a smaller study um, that happened a while ago. Yeah, but that's a great question and, and a direction for future work. Okay, thanks. I actually had the same exact question, but yeah. uh, if I can continue, because yeah. say if you have six authors, you cannot identify who of them made the decision to collaborate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How can you make any conclusion regarding the behavioral aspects of this work? All I you can uh, produce, and it may have its own value, is right. uh, the associative frequent incidence, and that's about it. Yes, yes. Because otherwise, you know, how can you justify any behavioral conclusions if you cannot identify uh, the people who make the decision? Right. So that's a great question. Um, and so we define behavioral gender homophily 
as any additional amount of homophily we find above what we find uh, above the compositional homophily level, right? And so what we're suggesting is that um, uh, anything above that seems to be the result of decision-making processes or factors that go beyond the structure of the communities. Um, but you're right that that does not um, provide us maybe more fine-grained information that we would want to have about who are making who are making the decisions, right? Um, and um, whose who's sort of power is, is most relevant in the composition of the team. So then I'm just curious how you can yeah. make recommendations of what to do mm -hmm. regarding changing the environment. Right. If you cannot make any conclusions about what behavior actually is. I see. Because there are so many factors right away go into this collaboration mm -hmm. uh, that would just uh, scramble the data, really. Right. So, uh, about the compositional homophilia, it's very clear, of course. Right. But the behavioral part, I would be very, very careful in making any conclusions until you can identify, maybe because what this the uh, you know, last and penultimate authors or something like this. I see, because I see. Because otherwise it's just completely unfounded to me. Right, so, yeah. right. Yeah, I see, I see. So yes, I think, so in our in our analysis, we're not, we are not doing any causal analyses. And because of that, we can't make direct interventional sort of recommendations. And instead, with that, with that um, in, the, in the conclusion discussion slide, um, what we're doing is um, sort of stepping back and thinking about the context of the other work on homophily and sociology that seems to suggest that it is these social factors um, or, or these social identities. Yeah. yeah. I, I didn't want to this, right. Uh, this part. It's right. just a particular study. Yeah. Right. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for that. Uh, yes. Uh, so when you showed your your alpha, I mean, it seems that homophily is widespread. On the other hand, the effect sizes seem small. Like most of the alphas are around like 0.1 or something like that, uh, and. Uh, of course, I mean, it would be, uh, that, that probably reflects, I mean, you, you have a very large corpus and you wouldn't expect, like, complete gender neutrality would be actually quite unlikely. So, I mean, I would expect small effects. So, uh, I'm not surprised to see there is significance across fields. Right. On the other hand, uh, it's, it, it could be small enough that it just doesn't really affect the whole intellectual uh, composition of the field. Right. So, like, do you have any insight of what would be an alpha that would be, like, important enough to actually, like, change the intellectual right. structure of the field? One of the challenges about using the alpha measure is that it doesn't have any intrinsic information in of itself by itself. And it's only meaningful in relation to, um, so it's the alpha measure we observe is meaningful in relation to the compositional alpha, uh, alpha measure we observe. And so when we're, uh, when we're comparing um, the two and, uh, and uh, evaluating for statistical significance, it's the comparison and, um, and, and so, it's it's a little bit tricky, but sorry. What was the second question that yeah, you had? It's just some question. But like even the comparisons are small. I mean, yes. it's a little bit above what you'd expect from compositional. But like, mm -hmm. how how do you have any insight of like how big the what's your minimum effect set of interest? I mean, what, how big an alpha has to be above to actually affect right. uh, information exchange in the in the? Yeah, good question. Oh, my slides disappeared. Well, I was going to show you. <laughs> so, given that we're interested in. Um, the differences in the alpha measures. Um, we did we did a further analysis where we um, set the statistical significance level even more strictly at 0.005, and what we find there is that even when you do that, you still see significant behavioral homophily um, at the field level um, and a surprising amount at the com uh, compositional field level. Yeah. Thanks. So I'm standing here for someone in the front row, so I'm going to bring the mic. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great study, very interesting. It's very interesting that you found the difference in cultures between fields in some fields. Uh, homophily is larger, some not. Um, what I would think, uh, I would think that the difference between organization would probably be more uh, pronounced the difference between fields. If you have papers from some institution, they probably have some institutional culture. Uh, do, do you plan to try to divide the papers according to the main institutions and see whether you can look at the institutional uh, differences? Oh, that would be a very interesting way of trying to get at an even finer grained understanding of, of the dynamics of what's going on. Unfortunately, Jevin, are you here? I, I'm not sure how 
<laughs> um, I, you know, we're, because we're using the JSTOR corpus, I'm not sure whether or not institutional affiliation is commonly included. Um, but if it is, then that would certainly be something to, to look no, at. We have a lot of, uh, in, in my organization, we have a lot of data with institutional affiliations. Yeah. Let's talk about this and see whether we can do it because it's very something very interesting. Yes, yes, and, and certainly, I mean, obviously, all, my collaborators are all from the same okay. university. Yeah. Even the postdoc who's now at Chicago was. Okay. So, yeah. Well, let's talk at lunch. Thank Great, you. thank you. Oh. Hi. Um, so I was. A little bit related to that question is the diversity of the collaborations and how that component might fit in. So I'm thinking about a situation where, you know, you're in a group and, you know, it's something that adding a female PhD student or a female postdoc to a group can immediately increase the diversity, but then you're just having the same people publish with the same cross-gender, like other gender author. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Is there a component to consider with repeat publication with the oh. same co-author? Like, is the what, what do you think that component? And have you thought about? I'm sure you have. That is a very <laughs> interesting question. If we were able to disambiguate authors, then that's something that we could explore. So, are the integrated teams we see um, repeat customers, right? Like repeat collaborations, um, and how much does that play a role in the the, the uh, results that we see? Yeah. So we haven't been able to see that yet. Hopefully we will in the future. Thanks for thanks have, for mentioning. Uh, uh, just on that, have you explored using anything like Orchid IDs or anything to try to get to bit oh. better this situation? <laughs> I don't know how much to say about this. Um, <laughs> it would be brilliant if we could um, create a database, um, and I, I would love for Orchid ID to do this, um, where people are able to um, identify different demographic characteristics so that we can uniquely identify individuals and know exactly what characteristics they have so that we can do these studies in, um, in more uh, rigorous ways. Um, my understanding is that that's not the case. And so maybe the best we could hope for is creating a, a parallel database that you can then sort of sort of combine with ORCID ID. Um, but that that's the dream. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Thank you. thanks. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Carol. This paper is so great. I had wanted to ask about, um, okay, so a lot of the sort of total gender homophily is explained by this clustering at the smallest subfields, you know, mm -hmm. that people are gender clustering into subfields. Um, and I wanted to ask about your ideas about what's causing that, because that, of course, might be caused by behavioral homophily, that people, in mm -hmm. fact, decide what subfields to go into by, in part, yes. looking at the gender composition of those subfields. Exactly. And then if so, if you're controlling for that, you're kind of underestimating the behavioral homophily. But right. then it occurred to me there are also other possible causes, like maybe women mm -hmm. who are super underrepresented don't end up leaving the subfield right. or leaving academia. Right. And so, yeah, have you guys thought about this? Or? Absolutely. Yeah. So one of the worries we have is precisely this kind of self-selection into intellectual communities where people might feel more comfortable working. Um, and so um, what we're careful to say um, in, in the paper is that um, we're not looking at the forces that drive the substructure structure, mm -hmm. right? So what are the forces that, that drive people to be in one intellectual community rather than another? Mm -hmm. We're just holding that constant and then trying to see if we see anything above that. But I think you're right to worry about this, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily even think of it as a worry. I'd be thinking mm -hmm. of it as something that probably means that yeah. underlying your effect is, mm -hmm. is stronger, actually, because right. even people's collaborators draw them into subfields. Right, right, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for that, Caitlin. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Great work. Um, so this is kind of a specific question on yeah. how you get the names assigned to gender, because yes. there's some concern that among kind of weird elite high SES populations, yeah. uh, the Social Security data, for example, may not be great. Uh -huh. Just as an example, um, like male politicians are disproportionately likely to have female sounding names. Huh. Yeah, just as an example. Yeah. So just wondering if you thought about that and if scientists might be weird like politicians, things like that. Right. So. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, scientists are weird like politicians. I guess this gets back to the previous talk about the social <laughs> context and reputation and uh, epistemic solid agents. Um, so uh, we don't consider that, but we do try to be quite conservative in our um, in inferences. So that's why we use 95% or higher confidence rating. Um, I've seen elsewhere people use a slightly lower percentage, but 
Um, I, and this is fairly standard. I don't know, Devin, if you have any thoughts on that or, okay, all right, thanks. Thank you for that. Um, my question was was also about the kind of the, the first level selection into to fields of various types, uh, but, uh, you know, asked and answered. Uh, so one thing that lots of people have spoken about earlier this morning is the relative likelihood of people with different expertises to combine in the context of a team. Mm -hmm. um, that was your motivating uh, example. Uh, but that assumes that people basically don't share the same subfield experience when they come together in the context of a project. And mm -hmm. so uh, I'm curious if there's an interaction with the likelihood, essentially, of gender homophily um, when you're considering work that's that basically spans different subject areas. If it's more likely to see homophily basically when I link to somebody across a subject area that I wouldn't otherwise link to as right. a function of my publishing history or if I'm less likely. Right. That's an interesting question and we haven't explored that, but that would be a, a, an interesting one to look at. So, you know, from the perspective of homophily, um, hmm, I'd have to think about this more. It could go both ways. So once you increase the domain of folks you could work with, it seems that the number of people that you could work with increases. And so you could find someone who was gender homophilous with you. Um, at the same time though, um, if, it's, if you're reaching across because you're driven by a particular narrow intellectual interest like meta science, um, then maybe the domain is actually much smaller than it might appear. We'll have to think about that. Thanks, thanks for the question there, James. Hello. Uh, hello. Uh, great talk. Uh, thank you thanks. for the presentation. So. Um, have you thought about, I know that you, you, talk in, you talk about the future work and trying to relate this to some kind of impact or, or other kinds of things that you find. And I'm wondering if you've you're thought about uh, that there is this effect that's uh, female, for example, drop out of science entirely. Yes. So maybe when you do the, this analysis of impact, where you, you should be careful about considering these kinds of biases. If you analyze uh, teams that are very successful, you're probably going to be missing out a lot of uh, females or Mm -hmm. you know, things based on race, people yeah. that drop out of science entirely. So that should be something that you should perhaps consider. Uh, Absolutely. Hopefully, does that influence dropping out of science or Absolutely, switching yeah, no. fields and things like that? Right. Absolutely. And um, in that slide on um, future work, I think thinking about dropout rates and attrition over time is especially valuable um, for thinking about whether gender homophily is actually a way to keep people in the pipeline. Yeah. Thank Great. you. Thanks. I know I'm keeping you all from lunch. So um, is this an okay I, time? I think this is an excellent okay, time, time to, to um, okay. break for lunch. Thank you.